Good evening. This is Lori Cook Daniels, uh, Forge's Policy and Program Director, uh, greeting you tonight and thanking you for being here. Michael Munson, the um, Director, Executive Director of Forge, will be helping me uh, with my slides. Um, and also uh, Caleb Weinhart, who is a Forge staffer, will be here. And I'll be introducing James Santel in a while. Um, and our ASL interpreters tonight are Derek and Sue. So I'm ready, Michael, if you are. Those of you that have done a Forge event before have seen our pink haired person. Um, this pink haired person shows up, I think, more often than any of the rest of, of Forge's people. And they're there to remind us to take care of ourselves because um, often the topics that Forge talks about are sensitive and many of us have trauma around them. So we ask you to please take care of yourself however you need to. Next, please. So what is We Teach? This is our first event. The long name is Wisconsin Transgender Education and Advocacy Coalition for Health. It's missing the last end of it, but so it gets us the We Teach. So We Teach is a trans service provider and community member coalition organized to improve living conditions for trans and non-binary people and our loved ones in Wisconsin. So we are often asked, how do we define the terms of trans service provider and community member? And we say everyone, we do not have the lines and we don't police the lines. So welcome all of you. Next, please. In 2019, Forge conducted a survey of trans Wisconsinites with over 500 respondents and 83% said that mental health issues impacted their daily life. Um, and that was pre-COVID. We know that since COVID, that in general, the mental health status of all Americans has deteriorated. So we know that that 83% is probably higher these days. For that reason, we have uh, focused our 2022 to 2023 We Teach Goal on improving the quality, availability, and access to trans competent mental health care in Wisconsin. Next slide. To increase availability of mental health care, these monthly meetings will help us identify existing resources because there are things out there that not all of us know about. We will also recruit additional mental health therapists um, can someone put the link in the chat for that, please? Um, Forge has a directory of mental health therapists in Wisconsin, and that's where we will start um, tra tracking our progress. We also have ambassadors who we have uh, recruited to work with and find more mental health therapists and resources in their areas. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. Next. Our current We Teach ambassadors are Barbara Farrar in Racine, Mika Jenkins in Wausau, AJ Hardy in Madison, and Jason Sewells in Chippewa Falls. We would like to have four more. Um, we are particularly looking for people who can look at, at the rural areas and at the uh, smaller cities and towns throughout Wisconsin. Right now, as anybody who does social services knows, in Wisconsin, it's easier to find services in Milwaukee and Madison, even related to trans people. It's harder in the other areas. So we are counting on these ambassadors to really help. Uh, stretch our reach. We currently have 112 uh, mental health professionals in our mental health provider directory. Um, we will be hopefully increasing our little thermometer chart there uh, on a regular basis to help us track how our progress is going. Next, please. We're also working, going to be working on improving the quality of mental health services. 
Our monthly We Teach meetings will discuss available resources so that we more of us can do proper, proper referrals and, and care. And then FORGE is going to offer four free training webinars on trans and non-binary mental health issues. These will be focused on for mental health therapists, but will be open to all. FORGE has been training service providers for almost 30 years. And what we will be presenting in these four training webinars is what we think it's most important for mental health therapists to know. Next, please. So we do have um, the monthly meeting topics set out uh, through May. Uh, the early ones are on resource mapping, uh, talking about mental health resources, LGBT health resources, and youth resources. And then later, um, as we move into 2023, we'll be looking at what are other people doing around trans issues uh, in Wisconsin. And we'll sum it up in May um, with a presentation on harm reduction, since that's such an important concept when we're working with the trans community. Next, please. We have four training webinars scheduled. These, uh, you can see here what we have scheduled. We're talking about uncovering barriers and building solutions in October. We're going to talk about adverse childhood experiences in November. I'll just give you a little preview of that. Um, studies have made it very clear that the things that happened to us in childhood have both physical and mental health implications all throughout our lifetimes. We also know that trans people have higher ACEs than uh, the general public. So that particular webinar will be talking about what we think is going on and what we think we can do about it. In January, we'll be talking about the health implications of what we're calling state-sanctioned hate, which is the, what's currently going on in many state um, legislatures where they are trying to pass laws to limit trans rights. And the last one will be in February, and we called it Dismantling the Gates. We're looking at informed consent model of care rather than the um, WPATH, the, the world um, psychological. <laughs> I'm not going to come up with it. It's the standards of care. <laughs> Next, please. Every month, we're going to give you an action opportunity. This is going to be a, uh, you can, it's a flyer. It's, it's on the web. You can see the URL there. Um, it'll give you an opportunity to do something concrete for an issue that is really pressing. This year, it's going to be, um, or no, I'm sorry, this month, it's the uh, work that's being done around Section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act. I'll take just a moment to explain this to you. So hopefully you will be interested in um, downloading downloading the sheet and following through yourself. The Affordable Care Act, or what's known as Obamacare, initially included a section 1557, I should have had Jim do this, that requires providers and insurers receiving federal funds to not deny or restrict access to health care based on sex, which includes gender identity and sexual orientation. It also prohibited health providers and insurance companies receiving federal funds from discriminating on the basis of sex, including anti-transgender discrimination and further prohibits discrimination based on race, national origin, age, and disability. What the Trump administration did was reinterpret what those protections were and basically watered them down, particularly related to transgender clients, transgender um, patients. The uh, Biden administration has proposed new regulations that really strengthen Section 1557 and gets us back to where we need it to be as a protection of trans uh, patients. And so we have until October 2nd to file comments and the 
action opportunity page will tell you where you can file those actions. So I encourage you to uh, help us out if you are able. Next, please. Next, we'd like to ask if there's anyone in the room that would like to share uh, anything that's happening in your organization related to trans, non-binary uh, people and our loved ones, anything your organization has done, anything that's coming up. Put your hand up, please. And um, someone behind the scenes will uh, unmute you. I want to give give people time to. Um, if it were me, I'd be trying to uh, find <laughs> find the a raise hand. Okay, and Michael is also saying in the chat you can feel free to also add your upcoming events in the chat. So let's go ahead and move on to our keynote. I am very thrilled to introduce James Santel, who's former United States Attorney for the Eastern District of Wisconsin. We met several years ago when um, James asked us to come and talk to his staff about trans issues, and we um, decided we liked what each other was doing. So. <laughs> I have him, I've asked him to come here tonight. He's going to talk about what our government is doing about transgender rights and opportunities. Um, actually, do you, why don't you introduce yourself? Is that all right? I will, I will do just that. Okay. We'll do that as I'm going to be screen sharing as well. So I think we'll be able to make all of this happen at one time. Let me begin by thanking uh, Forge for not only inviting me to be with you tonight, it is an honor, it is a professional honor, it is a personal delight to be with all of you, um, and again to renew some past associations. Laurie accurately uh, said that we met many years ago. One of the highlights of my time as the United States Attorney for the Eastern District of Wisconsin, an Obama appointee, uh, was the time that we invited Lori and her staff into the federal courthouse to chat about some of the kinds of issues we're going to be talking about tonight. It remains to this day when I am back in the federal courthouse, one of the most meaningful programs, the people who are there, and we look forward to more of that in the future. I want to begin tonight by, in addition to thanking all of you and expressing my great appreciation for inviting me to be with you, uh, by letting you know uh, that this is an incredibly important initiative that is being launched tonight. Um, I know that you appreciate that by virtue of the fact that you are participating tonight in it. I am so pleased to be a part of it because it defines our community. It tells us who we are and it motivates us to do the right things in the future at a very challenging time in the life of our history, of the history of our nation, our communities, and certainly our state as well. I want to tell you as well that, um, you that let me just see if I can do this here. Um, if not, I'm going to go back and see if I can get back into the screen share mode so I can move forward here. All right, let's go back and do this. And so I want to tell you as we begin and we move forward in the uh, presentation that uh, that we have a lot of material to discuss. And as Lori and Michael and, and Caleb and others know well, that uh, the material uh, is sometimes uh, dense, it's sometimes thick. I'm going to do my very best uh, to make it not only accessible, uh, but also something that will inspire you consistent with the Forge's mission and the other things that are all, are all about uh, we teach as we go forward here. We're gonna be talking a lot about some of the history of uh, cases and judicial decisions, government actions, and then going to talk about some of the things that have happened just in the past several weeks, June, July, and August of this year, that again are going to define not only our nation, our state, but our, also our communities. And so along the way, um, if there are questions, are you free to put them in the chat? I'll also reserve some time uh, at the end 
to do some general questions from the entire group. And again, very much looking forward to uh, being a part of this program. Let us go back. Let us start uh, with two cases um, that you recall well from 2013 and 2015 that you may not automatically think of as being uh, cases that fall into an area that would identify and promote uh, trans rights and trans issues, but they do. 2013, you may recall well the story of Edie Windsor, um, whose partner had died, and she was seeking through the Internal Revenue Service uh, certain tax credits. And under the law as it existed that, at that time, the Defense of Marriage Act, a federal statute signed by, yes, President Bill Clinton, that it made marriage a union between a man and a woman. And for that reason, uh, Edie uh, Windsor was denied her benefits to which she would otherwise have been entitled under the federal tax code. She went into court, in the federal district court, and said, you know what, this is wrong. I think DOMA is unconstitutional. I think this should be reversed. And indeed, even prior to her doing that, again, very much a, honored to be a part of the Obama administration and the Holder administration, the Attorney General at that time had decided that DOMA was indefensible and had directed all of us, uh, much with our support and our encouragement, not to defend DOMA in federal court. And you know the rest of the story, and that is that in 2013, the United States Supreme Court found indeed that the Defense of Marriage Act that defined marriage in this very narrow way um, is in fact not constitutional. And I pulled up from that in very important case, some wonderful lofty language that applies especially tonight and hopefully will animate all of us as we discuss important issues. And that is that, that the Constitution um, is not a document that should disparage or injure uh, but nonetheless, but rather it should protect us in our personhood and promote our dignity. That's very lofty language. It's in the Supreme Court decision um, authored by Justice Kennedy way back in 2013. And once again, it should be reflected in the decisions coming forward from federal courts, state courts, and our Supreme Court going forward. A couple of years later, you recall as well, again, a seminal case in the history of civil rights in America, a case called Obergefell. Uh, Mr. Oberfell and his partner identified there um, were uh, also together for a long period of time. His partner died, and as a result of marriage, not in the state of Ohio where he was uh, a, a domiciled residence at the time, um, he also sought a certain benefits and was not, in fact, given the uh, permission by the state of Ohio that, that refused to recognize his marriage uh, to his partner. And so likewise, went forward and through a series of cases in the federal courts, the lower courts, appellate courts, challenged the notion, challenged the notion that any state should, including Ohio, should deny um, any individual, regardless of their orientation, their identity, who they are uh, in, in any circumstance, should deny the right of people to marry. And again, after a lot of litigation and including argument to the United States Supreme Court in 2015, again, uh, Justice Anthony Kennedy wrote an equally lofty opinion and once again talked about the importance of human beings, um, as, not only as individuals, but in a community. Talked about the importance of, of dignity in the eyes of the law, and the Constitution grants us all that right to be acknowledged as human beings, to be acknowledged as who we are, and to be proud of that, that dignity he talked about. All of that, all of that continues to animate much of what we're going to talk about tonight which is in the end a story of affirmation of that, but also great challenge ahead. And we'll get to all of that as well. I noted here too, that in both of those cases, again, a different Supreme Court than the one we have today, uh, that Justice Kennedy was joined in that opinion by a Stephen Breyer, um, who is no longer on the court, as you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, also no longer on the court, Elena Kagan, Sonia Sotomayor. And so um, that important uh, uh, consolidation, if you will, of Supreme Court justices remains important as we understand what's happening today. And we'll get to that at the very end of our discussion tonight. So a couple of very seminal cases. Here is the one uh, that followed that followed Windsor and that followed uh, Obergefell that is, is perhaps the, the most fundamental uh, case to understand tonight when it comes to uh, the employment rights uh, under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Title VII, uh, describes and, and prohibits employers from discriminating in the terms and conditions of employment, hiring, firing, uh, managing employees generally, when it comes to all of the immutable characteristics that we know about, race, uh, national origin, 
uh, faithfully, um, uh, ability, disability, and yes, indeed, it talks about sex. The word sex is in there as it was set forth in 19, in the early, in the mid 1960s. And so the question before the Supreme Court in the case called Harris Funeral Homes, also known as Bostock, also known as Zarda, which I'll get to in just a moment or so, the question was whether or not that word sex, whether that word sex includes and contemplates protections uh, for sexual orientation and gender identity. It was a contested issue and lower courts had gone in all directions. Amy Stevens herself has an amazing story to tell. It is stunning to tell out loud, but it, it again reflects the continuing challenges that members of our transgender community continue to have today. She was employed for a very long period of time as a funeral director. And one day she came into work and she distributed a letter uh, that said she would be living her life uh, of, and going forward as a woman. And some a couple of weeks after receiving that letter, her employer fired her. Why? Because she announced exactly that, that she is transgender and she would be living her life going forward, both in her employment and in her personal life um, as a woman. Uh, stunningly, and I wrote it there because it is so stunning to see, when asked during the course of litigation why it is you fired this wonderful employee uh, uh, because she had uh, described who she was uh, and wanted to affirm who she was in her employment setting, her employer said, well, uh, he, he was going to represent himself, was no longer going to represent himself as a man. He wanted to wear a dress. And as much as we may, sort of the edges of our, our lips may, may, our mouths may curl up with a certain amount of, 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 of humor about that, it's also very serious, right? Because it reflects an attitude that frankly does not understand the nature of humanity and the dignity that the Supreme Court was talking about. What happens in this case? And I, I will tell you as well that two other defendants also uh, brought together in the Supreme Court case. In this case, again, uh, called Harris, whereas they called Bostock, you may know it, and also as Zarda, the United States Supreme Court, written by uh, no other than, than Neil Gorsuch, not exactly the most liberal Supreme Court justice, comes forward and says that Title VII of the Civil Rights Act does in fact protect people based upon sexual orientation and gender identity. It is not the lofty language that Justice Kennedy wrote in Obergefell and in Windsor, but nonetheless, it does the clinical work, if you will, of making this very important point that everyone, uh, transgender people, non-binary people, regardless of orientation and, and identity, you are all protected. We are all protected uh, by Title VII. Uh, and if in fact an employer engages in, not, in discriminatory conduct, you have a right of action. You can go into court and seek the return of your job. You can seek damages. All those kinds of things would otherwise be available to people under Title VII, a huge case. And it likewise animates what, what follows uh, to this day. Um, we see as well in this particular case, an interesting uh, amalgam of Supreme Court justices, Neil Gorsuch, once again, authoring the very opinion that I just described. John Roberts, the Chief Justice, also a traditionally a conservative justice, joins as, as do Stephen Breyer, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Elena Kagan, and Sonia Sotomayor to reach a six to three judgment in that case. You see there on the left uh, of your screen, um, that is a fellow named Donald Zarda. Um, Mr. Zarda's story is equally compelling. Uh, he was a, a, a skydiving enthusiast instructor, and uh, he routinely told his female clients, he was one of these fellows who strapped you quite literally to his body as they're jumping out of a plane, and uh, would often tell his clients about his sexual orientation. He was gay, um, and just to, as he would say, to avoid any awkwardness. And when uh, there was complaint about that, again, Mr. Zarda's employer fired him. Why? For being gay. And Mr. Zarda likewise pursued this in the federal courts and brought it up on this notion that this Title VII should protect him from being fired simply because he is gay. This is also a footnote, but very important aspect of this, and it's a tragedy. And it, it just reflects on how the law um, sometimes does not keep up with the history and the humanity of people involved in it. Mr. Zarda, because he was fired, went off to Europe and engaged in another kind of, 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 um, of instructoring uh, from uh, skydiving. It was very dangerous and he lost his life in Europe. He died even before the decision was rendered, but his name still attaches this consolidated case. 
um, as does the name of Gerald Bostock. And again, in 2000, beginning for 10 years in 2003, Mr. Bostock also has a story to tell in Clayton County, Georgia. Um, he was a juvenile court official. He was responsible very effectively for ensuring legal representation and support for minors there. Um, in 2013, he joined a gay softball league and his supervisors found out about it. And once again, they fired him because he was and is gay. Likewise, pursued these appeals, joined with Amy Stevens, coming to the United States Supreme Court, and finally getting this decision that again changed the landscape for America um, to the good for all of us. Uh, you see more a language there. Um, if you discriminate on the basis of homosexuality or transgender status, you are violating the law. And you're doing that in the employment setting in the same way that you would with any other human being uh, who is subject to and receives the benefits of the law in the United States of America. Notice these strong dissents. By whom? Uh, Justice Sam Alito, who you may recall uh, recently wrote the decision in Dobbs, Brett Kavanaugh, and Clarence Thomas. Um, during the course of their dissents, um, they rose, they, they articulated the same kind of specter that Judge Thomas recently uh, raised in connection with his, his concurrence in Dobbs, that is, what is next? And Justice uh, 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 Gorsuch came back and said, you know, today we're deciding that uh, people of, of all uh, gender, uh, gender statuses, un under, of, of all uh, sexual orientation, gender statuses, have the protection of the law. We will decide those future cases when they come before us. Um, the other justices in dissent were very much opposed to this and presumably will continue to be so as these cases percolate up. We'll come back to this at the very end of our presentation tonight. What has happened very recently? Again, a good news story in the midst of continuing challenges in America. Keisha Williams, a transgender woman, um, she is imprisoned um, for a crime that she has committed. That is not what this case is about. Um, she is um, initially housed for six months in Virginia um, in a women's prison, but eventually her jailer is fined uh, that uh, she is a transgender woman and they reassign her to the men's prison um, and, and uh, do things to her. They deny her uh, various medical treatments, including the transition related care that she was getting. She suffers horrific harassment by other, other inmates and also by her jailers. And she comes forth and she says that, you know what, under the Americans for Disabilities Act, I should be able to get the protections of the law, even in prison as a transgender woman. And what happens in the Fourth Circuit, which is not the Supreme Court, but an appellate court just below this, the, um, the United States Supreme Court, uh, in August, just a few weeks ago, the Fourth Circuit, an appeals court in the United States of America said this, the Americans with Disabilities Act does in fact prohibit discrimination against people with gender dysphoria. Now the ADA, when it was passed, talked of explicitly excluded um, categories of people uh, for transsexualism, as was described, and gender identity disorder. That's the way the law was written way back when George Bush signed this. And the district and the circuit court judge, um, whose name there you see, um, who's a part of a three judge panel, she comes forward and she says, you know what, her name is Diana Motz. She says, you know what, the ADA, the ADA's language is really no longer accurate. And she says that that the, the plain meaning of gender identity disorders, as that term was, was understood at the time, um, still does uh, contemplate that, that um, uh, people who are suffering from gender dysphoria, as does the plaintiff in this case, should in fact get the protections of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, gender identity disorder um, is no longer the language, of course, it is used. Um, and just because the language is different, does not mean that the protection for, for uh, the dysphoria uh, should not be acknowledged. Why is this case called Williams versus Kincaid out of the Fourth Circuit very important? And it is important. It's one that should be embraced by all Americans, including uh, those in, uh, in all communities, uh, including those who are transgender. Now, it, and it, it may strike you as a case, while this involves a prisoner inside a federal prison uh, who is alleging uh, dis a body dysphoria, um, and, and, and for that reason, it's very narrow in its scope. And I would offer to you that if you read the opinion, it could be interpreted that way, but it's actually much more. It is an affirmation, just like the previous case in Bostock and Stevens and Zarda, that indeed the civil rights laws, which the ADA is all about, 
do in fact cover our transgender populations. And the language of it, while it's not quite as lofty as that that was written by Justice Kennedy in those seminal cases, can in fact and should be used going forward, it's brand new, should be used to advance this fundamental notion that our transgender community takes its rightful place inside the laws of this country, not only when it comes to employment, but also when it comes to, the, to disability and disability rights being uh, pursued and promoted. Notably, notably, the DSM-5, as I suspect many of you know, has been revised to eliminate that old language that got everybody confused um, and, and now uh, more accurately describes the nature of the challenge. Also note that in 2017, prior to this August decision of the Fourth Circuit, there was a federal trial court in Pennsylvania that came to the same conclusion. So we've got a lower court and we've got an appeals court, both of which has said this major civil rights law does in fact cover the transgender community and provides protection. I provided you with that map as well, just to give you some sense of where the Fourth Circuit is. It's West Virginia, Virginia, North Carolina, and, and uh, South Carolina. And you can also see Plymouth, Kentucky, where the district court landed, they're in the Sixth Circuit. If at any time these cases should in fact go to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court will then wrestle with this issue, which was kind of much invited, if you will, by Judge Gor Justice Gorsuch in his opinion in Stevens. And so again, a real affirmation tonight of a very recent case, weeks old, in which transgendered rights in America are acknowledged and promoted and embraced, the case Williams versus Kincaid. Let me talk a little bit about the kinds of things that Lori was talking about before. A couple of things that the Biden administration, very significant thing the Biden administration has done. Uh, Lori appropriately encouraged your involvement in responding, providing comments to Section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare. Uh, this is another matter uh, that was just closed in comment a couple of days ago. Title IX, as I suspect all of you know, prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex for any schools, institutions, academic settings that receive financial assistance. And when President Biden became president, he issued an executive order. Again, this is not legislation. It's an executive order that he issued that said, I want, I want across government, a review of all of our regulations and practices, certainly the Department of Education, but also in the Department of Justice and Housing and Urban Development and Health and Human Services and Labor, Commerce, all our various departments, to determine whether or not we're in compliance with the law. And specifically, when it came to Title IX, he said, I wanna make certain that all students are guaranteed an educational environment in which they are free from discrimination based upon sex. And once again, plainly incorporating the notion of sexual identity and gender orienta uh, sexual orientation and gender identity inside that word as we now know it is described also prohibiting uh, harassment, violence, and other forms of misconduct, misbehavior in the academic setting. The Department of Education, again, just closed a couple of days ago, is putting together new rules under the Biden administration that ensure that Title IX for all of our students, um, young, middle-aged, and, and older, in educational settings that are getting financial support from the federal government, that likewise, the rights of all people are supported and that there is no discrimination, or at least there's an attempt to ensure that there's no discrimination in the academic setting. This is very significant, and it's again a reason to embrace this kind of activity. Look forward for the Department of Education to issue this rule, these new sets of rules, having to do with safeguarding transgender rights and the rights of others inside the academic institutions. One of many things that the Biden administration has done, but again, Laurie talked about Section 1557, a parallel attempt to ensure that inside the Affordable Care Act, likewise, we have no language, no provisions that would in any way inhibit the full exercise of rights by our transgender community. Um, let's talk a little bit about some history once again. I'm doing this again because I was very proud to be a part of the Obama administration, kinds of things that likewise are still in place today, notwithstanding, as Lori also indicated, uh, many of the attempts by the Trump administration to roll these back you know what they are. It's important, I think, to remember them tonight as we think about what's happening next. You know well that in 2009, after 25, 30 years of an attempt by the United States Congress to pass a broadened hate crimes law, President Obama did in fact uh, sign the uh, Shepherd Bird, Bird Act um, and found in fact inside that, that, that legislation uh, in, enabled people formerly like me 
to ensure that people of, of all uh, uh, gender uh, identities, sexual orientations, of all immutable characteristics can in fact be um, su subject to um, a re recompense for any hate crimes visited upon them based upon things like gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, disability, among all those other characteristics. A huge change in the law that protects the transgender community when in fact members of the community are subject likewise to hate crimes in our communities. We know well, regrettably, tonight uh, going forward that it continues to happen. This was a big change in the law and is being implemented to this day uh, by US attorney's offices around the country. Barack Obama also um, during his term entered an, an executive order just like the one that, that uh, uh, President Biden has entered prohibiting discrimination for any um, agencies, for any companies um, and any, any federal agencies as well uh, that might employ people uh, who are transgender ensure that there can be no discrimination uh, inside those employment settings. And again, also applies to contractors. So if I'm a contractor with the Defense Department, with the Commerce Department, with the Education Department, and I employ people, I cannot engage in any discrimination based upon those immutable characteristics, including transgender status. Again, an important change in the law under Barack Obama. And then further, as you know, again, it could be a subject of a, an hour long presentation in and of itself, also found that with respect to those members of the military, presently in the military who are transgender, or who want to enlist in the military who are transgender, ensuring that they have the right, the capacity, opportunity to come forward and say, yes, I'm transgender, and I want to serve in the military. There will be no discrimination when it comes to enlistment, no discrimination when it comes to advancement inside the military, and all attempts to try to engage in bias-based conduct would be turned back. Now, again, aspirational. Are we there completely when it comes to military and these other areas inside federal agencies? No, I'm not going to be so, so uh, uh, naive as to think that this has resulted in a complete change in our world. But the fact that our legislation and that our presidents, at least two of them in our recent uh, existence, have done exactly this is hugely important. Note as well, the very last uh, entry there on the right side of your screen, that during the course of the Trump administration, or he made reference to this as well, uh, Donald Trump, as you may well, well recall, first initially tweeted a rescission, a taking back of the Biden uh, rule on transgender involvement and enlistment in the military, and then directed that the Pentagon conduct a study of the extent to which having transgender individuals uh, in our military would have an impact upon our capacity to defend ourselves and engage in other things important to the safety and security of our nation. Again, an effort uh, 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 much, much uh, uh, aligning, uh, 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 malaligning rather, uh, the purposeful and very good work done under the Obama administration. Good to know that when Joe Biden became president, he shut all that down and returned, returned the policies of the Pentagon and of the, of the military back to the way they were. And that's where we are today. Again, aspirational to be sure, but nonetheless moving in that right direction. Let's talk about Wisconsin. I promised Lori and Michael that I would uh, talk about Wisconsin as well. A couple of things that are also uh, the source of some reason uh, to be uh, encouraged, but also to recognize we have continuing challenges right here in our states. Again, that combination of good news and reasons, likewise to be inspired to do more in the future. What about this use of pronouns um, in the state of Wisconsin? Well, uh, not too long ago, there were some parents who filed a lawsuit in uh, Dane County Circuit Court, which is basically Madison. This is in the, the state court, not the federal court, on the Madison Metropolitan School District. They were challenging, they were challenging a recent uh, enactment, a recent implementation of a, a new policy that permitted transgender students of the sort, perhaps it may be in that picture there, to come to school and ask that they be identified according to pronouns of their choosing. And further, the policy said that in our school district, we will not report back to your parents on that. If you have not yet come out to them, if you have not had those very important can candid conversations, there is nothing about your presence here in this school that is going to upset that relationship. And you can have the freedom and the confidence to know that in our school district, 
You can be identified by the pronouns and yes, indeed, by the names that you want to be called. These uh, some parents came forward and said, we're going to challenge that. And they did so. They filed a lawsuit in the Dane County Circuit Court. And along the way, interestingly, they did not want to be identified. I'll leave that for you to, under, to perhaps uh, guess about why that might be. They didn't want to be identified publicly. And one of the challenges, one of the questions before the, the state court judge was whether or not their names needed to be revealed. That is the names of the parents, not the students, not their young people going to class. And in the end, the state court judge said, I'm not gonna release your names publicly, but opposing counsel, who again are supporting this good and important new uh, piece of policy in Madison, uh, they will have your names so that they know who it is who's bringing this lawsuit. The entire matter, believe it or not, comes to the Wisconsin Supreme Court fairly recently and significantly. What happens again, I'm being fairly superficial here, the, United, the Wisconsin Supreme Court, by a narrow majority, as it always is, a case written by Brian Hagedorn, who again, traditionally viewed as one of the more conservative justices, joins with the so-called liberals. Again, titles that aren't, aren't always very helpful, but nonetheless, four to three, makes a decision that this case should not be in front of the, the Supreme Court and sends it back to the Dane County Circuit Court for more adjudication. Also says, oh, by the way, the decision uh, to disclose your names of the parents to opposing counsel was the right one. Why is this important? Well, it shows number one, that the Wisconsin Supreme Court, at least in this setting, again, by a divided court, by a divided court, underscoring once again, the importance of voting in the Supreme Court election coming up in the spring. The Wisconsin Supreme Court said, you know what? We're going to let this policy stand while the lower court figures out what to do with the claims against it. And so today, the good news about this particular case is, that the lower court, um, even as it continues to supervise the litigation, has not upset that policy. And students who are going to school in the Madison Metropolitan School District can in fact still enjoy this protection and do not have to uh, have, uh, in, can in identify themselves by names and by their pronouns in the school setting uh, with liberty and with freedom to do so without having the school go back to parents who may or may not know about that. Again, an important issue for our transgender students as well. Let's talk about athletics, another issue right here in Wisconsin. And the question is whether or not there's a state policy regarding athletics, again, an awful lot. See the very last bullet point there? We had our state legislature not too long ago attempt addressing this issue of transgender involvement in sports, tried to, to legislate and to ban certain transgender athletes from participating in female sports. Um, our governor vetoed that legislation, vetoed that, said that's not going to happen here. And so today, today, there is in fact a policy by virtue of that attempted unsuccessful legislation, the veto by the governor, and by the actions of the Wisconsin Interscholastic Athletic Association to articulate this very forward-looking, maybe not perfect, but and maybe this, and, uh, somewhat around the edges, sometimes challenging to implement, a policy that once again, like those seminal cases, explores and advances and embraces the dignity of all human beings, including uh, transgender boys and girls, men and women who want to participate in sports and says, you know what, uh, we're going to live, give everybody opportunities regardless of their creed, color, sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, all the other immutable characteristics. How are we going to do this? They set forth, it's not on the screen there, they set forth a, a, a practice for identifying uh, those students who are in fact transgender to ensure that there's a, a predicate for embracing them. And I won't go into that right now, but you can find it in the policy. It's, it's very straightforward. It's not too burdensome. It requires a little bit of paperwork and a little bit of information sharing. But note again that the IAA says, we're going to premise all this on what? On medical knowledge, on scientific validity, science and medicine, the things that, that, that again, the Fourth Circuit was embracing when it addressed the issue of dysphoria, uh, uh, dysphoria, right? And under the ADA, that all of those kinds of things should in fact be incorporated into our approach to ensuring that our transgender boys and girls, men and women have the capacity, the ability to play sports in the state of Wisconsin. Again, um, is it perfect? Um, is it uniformly applied? Uh, probably not. And that's the reason why you continue to work on enforcement actions to ensure that it does. 
Here's a case that I'm going to mention, again, probably fairly narrow in its application um, as we begin to work toward the end of, of my comments tonight. Probably doesn't have a huge application, but once again comes out of the state of Wisconsin. Um, a, a, a transgender woman named Ella um, entered the criminal justice system there, identifying as a male. Um, she was previously uh, convicted of engaging in a crime, uh, sexually assaulting a 14-year-old boy. And the question was whether or not, whether or not under the state law, um, she could um, identify herself in the uh, sex, uh, sex offender registry um, as Ella, as a female, as opposed to a male. And the Wisconsin Supreme Court, after addressing this issue, said no. And so this is one of those cases that probably doesn't have a huge applicability, but you should know about it because the answer, again, from Rebecca Bradley and the majority of the Wisconsin Supreme Court, again, very recently, just this past summer or so, was that sex offender registration, including for Ella, um, is not cruel and unusual under the Eighth Amendment and, and, that, that the, her right to freedom of speech, which is what she was alleging, does not, does not compel the state to facilitate a change of her legal name for virtue, for, uh, for purposes of that registration. That's a lot to consume, I know. Suffice to say, um, this is a narrow opinion. Um, my own view is that it is not a properly decided opinion. There is a minority of Supreme Court justices who did write in the opposite direction. But you should know about it uh, nonetheless, because it's a part of our jurisprudence in the state in which we live and in which uh, we have our livelihood. And let's talk very generally. Again, lots and lots of things we can embrace. Again, imperfectly administered here in Wisconsin. And I've given you there just a list. I suspect that during the course of your wonderful uh, We Teach events coming up, programs every month, and other things that Lori and Michael and, and others are going to be doing, many of these issues will be discussed. But know once again that in the state of Wisconsin um, that uh, you can in fact amend your birth certificate to officially change your name. There's a process for doing that. That the state Medicare pro Medicaid programs do in fact um, permit um, government employees and also non-government employees um, to uh, get sex reassignment surgery under Medicaid. That's very important, right? Um, incarcerated persons are entitled to hormone therapy the kinds of things that probably would have happened in the Fourth Circuit case had she not been uh, subject to the harassment that she was. Um, federal courts said had ruled that a blanket prohibition on that was unconstitutional, so going in just the opposite uh, direction. Um, an executive order, again, by our governor, just a signature on a document, says that if you use any taxpayer dollars, uh, federal ta uh, state taxpayer dollars, you cannot use them to support any conversion therapy for LGBT minors in the state of Wisconsin. We know as well, not listed here, about the attempts uh, throughout many of our communities to ban conversion therapy and the horrific things that it does. Those efforts continue. We've got something of a patchwork right now in the state of Wisconsin, but those efforts likewise underway. An executive order prohibiting any state tax dollars from being used in that connection. And finally, um, no public or, or, or private school that receives a federal funding uh, can engage in discriminatory practices. Um, they've got to provide reporting. They've got to ensure compliance with the law, including when it comes to bullying of, of anyone, including members of the transgender community who are part of our schools. So a lot of things in Wisconsin uh, to celebrate, even though, even though they're imperfectly advanced and promoted to this time. And so as I begin to conclude, let me also identify for you some of the great challenges that are still out there and then we'll open this up to some questions and comments along the way. You all know, I suspect, about the Equality Act. We could likewise spend a huge amount of time talking about the content of that, the importance of that, and the fact that it has been introduced in virtually every Congress in recent years. What does it say? It's very simple. Although the language is obviously written by a lawyer, written by congressional attorneys there, basically it says that all these things we're talking about, our rights to be free from discrimination in housing, in public accommodations, um, in education, in federal benefits, the program benefits you may receive, um, financial credit, even jury service in a, in a courtroom, and yes, indeed, and, and, and also employment, employment, a matter now probably taken care of by the Stevens Bostock Zarda case we talked about earlier. Equality Act is this omnibus federal statute proposed 
not yet law because it hasn't passed Congress, it is stalled there, that would provide for equal treatment and non-discrimination of everyone, regardless of their gender identity, regardless of sexual orientation, would include under the word sex, the transgender community, uh, people of all, once again, all gender identities and sexual orientations, as we learned in Bostock, in, in Bostock and the other cases there. It is a broad piece of legislation that affirms the right of every American to enjoy all of these kinds of things. And if passed, if passed, it would make a lot of the other lit litigation out there involving, uh, for example, housing and, and public accommodations and even, even financial issues, it would basically mean that that is the law of, of the country. And absent any further interpretations by the Supreme Court, it would be the law of the land. And that's why it's so very significant. As I said, one of those probably taken care of right now by virtue of the decision in Stevens, but a lot more to be covered there. And so the Equality Act is still something we need to be focused on and advocating for. Uh, Lori mentioned this at the start of our time together tonight. Uh, this is sobering because even in the midst of these movement forwards, and I wanna be positive about much of this, but also to be very, very sanguine, very, very appro approachable and very much understanding about the great challenges that are still out there in Wisconsin and many other states of our nation. As Lori said, there are efforts to roll all of this back, to do it legislatively, principally in the states, but not exclusively, also sometimes in the federal and the uh, Congress as well. You see last year, 2021, about 130 bills in 33 different states introduced to roll back, to limit, to restrict the rights of transgender people on various aspects of lives and livelihoods. That's horrific. That is stunning to see, right? That we've got legislatures that are attempting to do that. Not all of them successful, but some of them are. And look at 2022, this very year, uh, in, into the, the ninth month alone, we've got even more, 230 pieces of legislation in state legislatures across our nation, trying to limit the kinds of things we're talking about tonight. Things that are established by the courts, things the courts are still wrestling with on a regular basis, um, and efforts by state legislators, including those here in the state of Wisconsin, as we just saw in at least one other area, to try to roll back these fundamental rights that, again, Justice Kennedy spoke about so very in a very a lofty and important way. I also want to identify one more. And again, you could identify many, many challenges that are still out there. I want to be very, very clear and plain about this. I do a fair amount of, of uh, pro bono work for um, uh, uh, folks who are facing eviction and also working with the homeless people in Milwaukee. One of the things I've been doing fairly recently as well is working as a guardian ad litem uh, in the children's court here in the Milwaukee County um, and also in other places. And one of the things I have come to recognize is the importance of understanding, obviously, the homes, the residences, the, the settings in which children are placed, either temporarily or permanently, um, whether their children need a protective services whether their parents can continue to provide them with the parental support that they need, the kinds of things courts wrestle with. And I've come to appreciate, I knew it academically before, but I've come to appreciate in a new way, the importance of transgender rights being acknowledged in the state courts across our land when it comes to parental rights as well. We have some states, we have some states out there where it is, it is presumed that if you are transgendered, you are unfit, you are unfit to serve as a parent. Um, many other states, many other states, it is completely irrelevant. And in the work that I've done here in, in Wisconsin, that has been my experience. The judges do not look to that. However, however, I identify it once again as a challenge because we know well that when it comes to adoption and um, uh, custody and visitation rights, all those kinds of things, this issue likewise looms large and should continue to be very much on our radar as we go forward. Final thing I want to say before I do open this up finally to questions and comments and thoughts that you may. You know well that the Supreme Court that decided those cases, including Bostock and Stevens and, and Zarda, the Supreme Court that decided um, uh, Ogrefell and Windsor, those courts are no longer there. You know well the implications of the uh, appointments made by former President Trump, three appointments to the Supreme Court that have undeniably changed the balance of the United States Supreme Court. You saw that this past summer in a number of very, very significant cases. Perhaps the most significant of them, which um, I suspect all of you know, is the decision in Dobbs 
overturning of 50 years, almost 50 years of civil rights, human rights history, and understanding in this country about the capacity of women to make decisions, and about for men as well, to make decisions, and people of all gender identities and sexual orientations to make decisions about their own bodies, overturned and reversed by Justice Alito's opinion. Along the way, you also know, you also know that uh, Justice Thomas, in his concurrence in that, that case, said that this should just be the beginning. Again, it's not the law, but he said, you know what, we need to visit, revisit the right to contraception. We need to revisit the right to same-sex marriage. We need to visit the right to same-sex relationships. All those kinds of things have been settled law when it comes to human rights and civil rights for decades. And again, perhaps some other time we can chat more about the implications of that. A Supreme Court also this past summer that that, it, that enlarged, enlarged at a time of great violence in America, gun violence, enlarged the capacity of individuals to own and possess and use weapons outside of the home in a case called Bruin out of New York. A, a Supreme Court that, that prohibited our president from imposing greenhouse gas limitations to address climate change. All kinds of things happened. 60 different opinions, not all of them in that category, many of them uh, very stunning when it comes to reversing and limiting the capacity of government to impress upon all of us the importance of human rights and to embrace the notion that all of us should have the right to engage in the liberties um, of our generations that have preceded us and should come uh, after this as well. The Supreme Court is going to be reconvening again uh, come October 1, less than a month, about three weeks from now. It's already begun to put on its docket some very important cases, including one in the environmental area, uh, including one that has to do with elections uh, and the rights of state legislatures to decide cases involving voting uh, disputes, hugely important, which again, we can chat about some other time. But there's another case that I wanted to highlight because it likewise warrants your attention tonight as we think about the things that we can and should celebrate, but also the challenges that are still out there. The Supreme Court has decided to review a case, once again, coming out of the state of Colorado. I suspect all of you will remember a case uh, back in 2018. It's called The Wedding Cake. Um, actually, Masterpiece um, uh, Cake uh, Creators, if, if you will. Um, this was the, the situation where um, a baker refused to bake a cake for a same-sex couple. Remember this case? And challenged the Colorado law that prohibited discrimination by businesses based upon, among other things, sexual orientation and gender identity and the word sex generally being, being applied, um, at, along with all the other immutable characteristics. The Colorado law said you cannot do that. And that particular baker said, no, that's a violation of my First Amendment rights, my religious rights, my beliefs. And this came up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court did not actually decide the case. They sent it back to Colorado and said, well, you kind of mistreated the baker when it came to the administrative procedures. And so they never really decided this, this seeming conflict between religious rights and religious liberties and freedom of, of expression as it's described, and the rights of people to be free from discriminatory practices uh, based upon sexual orientation and gender identity. They never decided it. Well, it's back. Coming out of Colorado once again, this time not a baking case, but a woman who provides uh, couples uh, with wedding websites and uh, 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 plainly uh, websites that will promote, will describe the wedding, presumably registries for, for gifts, all those kinds of things, locations, what you need to know if you come to our wedding. And she has declined, she has refused once again to engage in commercial and contracts with same-sex couples. Same kind of thing instead of a cake, it's website services. And she says that that same Colorado law that prohibits discrimination based upon commercial enterprises, contracts, and based upon uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, um, that would prohibit her also um, from discriminating against people in our transgender community, that that law cannot stand. And she raises once again her free speech rights, so-called free speech rights in the First Amendment, and then also her religious liberties, and says, this is contrary to my religious beliefs, and I am going to challenge that law as being unconstitutional. The Supreme Court has decided to review that case, and they're going to be entertaining oral argument on it this coming term, probably this fall, probably in a matter of weeks, if not months. Watch this case carefully, because unlike the wedding cake case, probably now the Supreme Court's going to have to wrestle 
with this age old, um, seemingly age old conflict. It shouldn't be there, doesn't have to be there in my, my view, between religious liberties and the, the so-called, as she said, the compelling uh, someone to speak and the fundamental rights of people to be who they are and to engage in commercial uh, contracts, to have websites, to have cakes made, do other things for, for weddings and other things, um, not based upon the immutable characteristic of, of sexual orientation or gender identity, transgender status, but based upon the fact that they're people who love each other and who want to engage in commercial activities of other kinds, employment and commerce and healthcare and education and the arts, all those kinds of things. Supreme Court's now gonna be wrestling with that issue. And we know from a series of Supreme Court cases, again, just this past year, including and especially in the religious area that overwhelmingly about 80% of the time the Supreme Court wrestles with religious cases, they side in favor of religion. Now. I've got nothing against spirituality. Um, I've got nothing at all against religion um, at all. However, I do think it's possible to reconcile personally held beliefs about religion and a decision not to discriminate against someone else because they happen to be transgender or they happen to be a gay or, or, or lesbian, um, uh, uh, anyone among the LGBTQIA population. Um, those things do not have to be in conflict. And you do not have to abandon your religious beliefs. You don't have to abandon your free speech rights uh, to ensure that people uh, are nonetheless uh, supported and have the rights to contract, have the rights to be free from discrimination in my relationships with them. I think that's how that can happen. We will see whether the Supreme Court, what will they will do with this case. I identify it for you tonight, 303 Creative versus Alinas, 303 Creative versus Alinas, because you should watch this case. It will probably be decided again in June of next year, uh, again, a full, what, eight or nine months from now. And it will be among the major cases this term of the Supreme Court uh, will issue. Uh, I will finish on the notion that while it's a different Supreme Court, we also have a new Supreme Court justice who took Stephen Breyer's place, as you know, uh, Katanji Brown Jackson, who came up from the Court of Appeals in the District of Columbia. Uh, she is a bright figure. And in her, the few decisions that she has already made, every indication that she is the kind of person based upon her past history as an appeals court judge, based upon the few decisions that she has had the opportunity to make up to now as a member of the Supreme Court, that she is someone who understands, understands discrimination in America, uh, not only because of her own race and her own color, but because she has been brought up in a family and in a community that understands that we are all Americans, that we are all human beings, we are all entitled to the, the protections of the law. Every reason to believe that she will follow in Stephen Breyer's uh, capacity to support those kinds of things going forward. She still remains among a minority, a minority of Supreme Court justices. And that's the reason why this case in Alinas and the other matters, if indeed the Fourth Circuit case goes up to the Supreme Court, likewise, very important to continue to monitor all of that. I want to thank once again Forge for not only inviting me to be with you tonight, uh, spending this time with you doing this, frankly, fairly superficial examination of recent developments, things that have happened in the federal system, in the state system, affecting transgender rights. My great honor, my great pleasure to do it. Know, know that this continues to be a great challenge. And none of us, none of us, whether we're lawyers, whether we're educators, whether there are people affiliated with, with FORGE and other wonderful institutions out there, um, none of us can give up this fight uh, because absent that continuing advocacy in all of these areas, it is very easy as we have seen for fundamental rights to slip back in the opposite direction. Um, I encourage you to continue this education process with this wonderful We Teach program and initiative that Lori and Michael and, and others are, are advancing tonight. I am so proud to be a part, a small part of this process to initiate it with you tonight. And I will very much look forward right now, Lori, Michael, and, and uh, all of you to your questions and comments in the time that we have left. Thank you very much, Jim. And I'm going to tease you and tell you I'm still trying to catch my breath. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, it's we, a lot. <laughs> we would like to open it for questions. And while you uh, pull your questions together, I had one for you, Jim. I did not understand 
the logic behind the Williams versus Kincaid case, yes. where um, the, Amer the Americans with Disabilities Act specifically said, we're not going to cover trans people. And yet the judges found that we could now. Can you explain how they had the logic of how they got there? Right, exactly. And I think it's really, it's a great question. Um, there were other courts that plainly looked at the, the, the ADA when it was passed. And to this day, to this day, even though once again, the DSM has changed its language, to this day excludes from its protections um, uh, transsexualism, uh, that word, that phrase, and also gender identity disorder, okay? And so the question was whether or not uh, Keisha Williams, a transgender woman, who is suffering from gender dysphoria, whether she in fact gets protections under that law under gender identity disorder. And what the, 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 the panel said, what, what uh, uh, the judge said in this case was, this is old language that we're using here. That in fact, um, what we should be talking about is simply um, uh, gender dysphoria and the fact that the DSM now recognizes that better language and that appropriate way to describe this. If, if, you, be, if you stay wedded to the old language uh, that talks about this in that, that way, you will, you will come to a result uh, that is not the intent of the ADA. And so really, I, that may not be uh, entirely um, uh, even clearer, but really what she is saying is we've got to get rid of this old language. Under, uh, under, the, under our, our understanding of gender dysphoria today, um, we know, we know that the ADA uh, should in fact cover uh, people who are suffering from that. And, and the, the old language should not stop us from embracing that broad interpretation. Does that make some sense? Yeah. I think it's a language issue that she's wrestling. Yeah. But it's also significant. It's not just words. It's it, because it does convey this huge, important right under the ADA. And as I said, I think it goes to your question as well. Um, the language of this could have meaning far beyond just the ADA. It could be uh, in the area, again, of housing and employment, again, to the extent that that continues to be an issue, and public accommodations. Um, if if uh, gender dysphoria, again, uh, in this case, um, it, it does sort of narrow the, the scope of it, but the notion that a civil rights law has now once again been not expanded, but interpreted to mean what it was meant to mean, that's huge for America. That's huge for America. Thank you. Other questions, you can uh, raise your hand and we'll unmute you or you could put it in the chat. I encourage you to um, use this opportunity. Uh, James has, um, we didn't we didn't read his bio, but um, if I read his bio to you, it would take a few minutes and it would clearly tell you um, how broad his knowledge is. So more, more questions? I know I was also going to say that um, two things, one is, is a little bit more lighthearted than the other, um, but the reason that I'm putting up on the screen there for you to copy and take down is if tonight um, you ponder all of this, and yes, it is a lot to take in, I know, um, and you have a question about it, you can certainly, again, I will say, Lori and, and Michael, you could reach out to wonderful leadership here, but you can also send me a text if you like, or send me an email, and I will respond to that as well. Um, and so uh, keep that in mind, too, as you think about questions that are out there. The more lighthearted thing that I will say is that if you do um, reach out to me, and, and uh, I will say, Lori, that, that, um, and to the entire group, um, Again, not only because of our longstanding affiliation and this wonderful program that was presented at the federal courthouse many years ago, um, I've enjoyed this excellent relationship um, with Forge. At the time, Lori came to me and said, uh, we'd like to initiate, we teach, and we've got this wonderful, wonderful uh, initiative. Um, she also gave me, and I've, I suspect you have not forgotten this, Lori, she gave me bookmarks. And so <laughs> um, in my file, ever since that time, um, if you uh, if you reach out to me, I'm going to keep at least one for myself, and I use them. But if you reach out to me, and maybe Lori, you've got others, but um, I'll also try to get you a bookmark that uh, uh, Lori had sent to me with, with all the good contact information here, and remind you about the important work that Forge is doing in this area. 
Uh, well, I'm touched that you still have them. <clears throat> I do have a couple of questions for you. Go ahead, go ahead. Can you speak to the banning of pride flags in school? Yes. Any cases yes. regarding those? Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, this is a First Amendment issue. Um, I will tell you uh, that I am equally proud. I'm honored right now to be representing um, at least one teacher and maybe a larger group um, in a suburban school district in, in uh, the Milwaukee area. Um, a teacher who was disciplined for refusing to remove a flag. I suspect you know well uh, about this. It's been much in the media. Um, and uh, again, honored to work on that case, even though once again, it is a challenge. Um, what about this? Um, the answer again could take up, and Lori and Michael will appreciate this fully. I could do another hour on the First Amendment rights of teachers and of students. Um, you should know that in the context with, of one of the recent religious cases, remember the case um, it just decided, I'm sure you all do, the football player, uh, I'm sorry, but the football coach who was conducting prayers with his team on the 50-yard line after the games, right? Um, and the Supreme Court said that uh, because that wasn't really an educational event, more elaborate than that, that, that he has a religious liberty right to do that. Along the way, kind of dropped as a footnote, but important affirmation, the Supreme Court reaffirmed that teachers and students do not lose their First Amendment rights to speech, to expression, to, to public uh, congregation, to assembly, just because they enter the schoolyard gates. Um, a reaffirmation. That came out of a case from, frankly, the 1960s, um, all, also reaffirmed in the decades that followed, uh, by Thurgood Marshall, who once again wrote this. He said, just because you're a student or a teacher, you do not lose your First Amendment rights. And so, for students, for students, um, the the, the um, landscape is a bit more complex, but the courts have, for the most part, um, given them a fairly wide breadth of capacity to uh, post things uh, and to um, otherwise express their beliefs in the academic setting. There have been some limitations on that, especially when it comes to newspapers, student newspapers. But you may also recall um, a case uh, in which the uh, Supreme Court also said that um, if a student decides to text um, and is very critical of her dis school district. That's a freedom of speech right that the school district cannot impinge upon. So students have an awful lot of rights when it comes to that, including, uh, for example, uh, posting on their lockers, inside their lockers, even in hallways, um, again, appropriate places to do it, pride flags and other affirmations. Um, but again, you will get judges who will go in all sorts of directions. With respect to teachers, it's a bit more restricted because once again, teachers are in a contract relationship and the Supreme Court has said in another case, unrelated to pride flags and unrelated to um, LGBTQIA issues, that if you are a contracted public employee, again, this is all about public schools, not private schools, but public employees, you don't have many, if, if all any uh, uh, freedom of speech rights. And so, th but they also said in the same case, um, when it comes to these kinds of things, maybe we can still carve out some free speech uh, rights uh, for teachers. So it's, it's a, a little bit unclear. What does all of that, that gibberish that I just said basically mean? It basically means that, that the issue is still being contested. There is authority in both directions to, and, and again, I certainly have taken the advocacy position that um, under Supreme Court precedent um, uh, that goes way back to the 60s, Students have a right to protest. Students have a right to, to post, um, again, non-confrontational, non uh, a pride flag that is simply, once again, an affirmation of humanity, right? Um, they've got the right and capacity to do that, and there's legal support for that notion. That's not to say that school boards around the country and judges may say, Mr. Santel, you're not right about that. I'm going to choose this other body of law and rule against you. When it comes to teachers, once again, I quite literally am advocating for one of them right now with, um, frankly, some very mixed results. Um, because again, you've got a school board that feels strongly that they can regulate its empl their employees who are teachers. Uh, but even so, um, teachers do not check their rights either. And when it comes to things that are, they're not inciting violence, they're not in, in, they're not, um, in any way offensive, um, in terms of identifying um, a, a select group for discrimination or for bullying, 
just the opposite, right? The school teachers who post pride flags do it, why? Because it's a place of, of calm and of solace and embracing. It's a sign, as my client says, that this is a place where you can in fact um, be, um, speak uh, uh, proudly, uh, but also speak safely about who you are and what you want to do in your life. That shouldn't be something that is a subject to being taken down by a, a school district or a principal. And that's the argument that we're making. You will get different results. The Supreme Court has not yet ruled on that particular area, but likely headed there in some case, somewhere, someday. Thank you. And we do have another question. Can you describe the role of science and biology and how they will play in the trans athlete bills? I think I missed something. Sure, sure. So once again, um, one of the things about Wisconsin's um, uh, standards here and those in most other states, I know Illinois as well, and in Pennsylvania, many other states, um, they make this affirmation um, about the importance of science and about medical understanding and scientific validity, um, principally because they're pushing back linguistically, but realistically, practically, on those people who simply say, without, without scientific and without medical knowledge that, that I mean, to, I will say this out loud, but obviously you understand, I, don't, I do not agree with this, that, that boys should not be playing on girls' teams, right? That's how you often hear this, right? And the, the, those who would attack um, the capacity of transgendered boys and girls, and girls should not be playing on boys' teams, um, those kinds of things. That, that what the reason for the policies um, talking about science and medicine are that those kinds of statements are not premised upon science and not premised upon medical knowledge. That indeed, indeed, especially with hormone therapies and other transitional therapies, those kinds of things. Um, and, and frankly, even the scientific knowledge more and more as we identify, as we keep track of these things, that, um, that the, it, it does not imbalance the sports uh, field it doesn't have a dramatic impact upon the results of, of athletic competition. That's the science, that's the methodology, that's the statistical support that the um, authors of these policies are looking to. And as we have more school districts that are saying, yes, indeed, um, transgender um, students, boys, girls, uh, men and women, should in fact be permitted to play on, on teams uh, in their schools, we will get more evidence, to, uh, medical evidence and scientific evidence and athletic evidence that indeed uh, there is not a disruption in the competitive field and the competitive uh, atmosphere. And so that's what that's about. It's really saying, um, let's base our policies upon what we know and everything we know indicates that transgender students playing on, on athletic teams does not, does not have a detrimental impact upon individuals or upon the teams that they participate with and in. I, I think it's really interesting in, in this situation of the schools that um, a girl who kept winning was charged by some of her competitors as, well, she must be trans because she keeps winning. Um, and we kind of had warned people that that's what was going to happen. <laughs> Absolutely. We're going we, we, to put it. I mean, we, we, we joke about it because it's, it's it, we, because the, the opposite side is so ridiculous. Um, that's right. In athletics, we have good athletes, right? We have <laughs> people who are, uh, who have, have perfected their athleticism and they win. And then we've got athletes um, who are not as good and they lose. And that's what competitive sports is all about. And that's, that's really what sort of undermines these, not undermines, underscores and supports these policies. If you look, for example, at the Wisconsin uh, system, and again, I haven't described it here. It's about four or five paragraphs. It's not too burdensome. About some of the reporting that has to be done to confirm that, in fact, the, the, athlete, the athlete is transgender and there's confirmation of that. And, and everyone uh, appreciates that and knows that. Um, but it's, it's just to promote that notion that on the playing field, then we're going to have good athletes and bad athletes. Somebody's going to win. So, and to your point, uh, Lori, somebody's going to lose. 
That's how it's always been. Nothing has changed as a result of this. I think your, your illustration is an excellent one. Right. Okay, Jim, would, would you uh, hand back control? Yes, I will um, certainly. So that Michael can put up my last slides. And I wanted to notice this is going on that the questioner on the sports question said that they got it. They had misheard what you uh, had said earlier. So we we closed that little loop. Wonderful. And um, we had told people we were going to try and be done by 830. And it looks like we're going to make it. So let me go over a last few things. Our next meeting is October 12th. We're gonna be talking about resource mapping. So we're gonna be getting, beginning to get a sense of what do all of us know that the rest of us should know. So that's that will be resource mapping. Next slide, please. Our first webinar will be October 6th um, on supporting trans mental health, uncovering barriers and building solutions. And I will remind people that these are aimed at mental health therapists, but they are of interest and they are open to anyone that has an interest in that topic. Next, please. Don't forget to take a look at the Take Action page. It will tell you exactly what you can do. It doesn't need to be a lot of time, but it can be really important. Um, be an ambassador. We are still looking for some ambassadors uh, from rural and kind of the, the non-Madison, non-Milwaukee parts of Wisconsin. Uh, so let me know if, you, if you're interested or you know someone else who might be interested. Next, please. And give us feedback. I love this little monkey uh, um, in the mirror here. The, when when you log out of this Zoom meeting, you will you will automatically get an evaluation form, and um, we would really like to have you fill it out. We try to make it short uh, to give us a sense, so we have more sense of how to how to shape this even more to meet your needs as well as as ours. Um, and I think that's my last one. Yes, ah, email. Email is we teach at Forge Forward. Our website is forge.tips slash we teach. Um, and we really want to thank you all for coming. And I'm seeing uh, that there are people making comments for Jim and thanking us. And that's great. So thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, everybody. Have a good evening. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Jim. It was it was great. Thank you.